Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Um, I hope this will become a series uh, to help not only the people here, but also uh, the people across the United States and the world um, develop critical thinking skills, uh, the ability to speak well, and the ability to write well. Um, because all of these things are absolutely vital um, to any revolutionary so that they can organize their thoughts, uh, they can share those thoughts, and they can disseminate those thoughts through writing. So um, I'm going through uh, revolutionary thinking. Um, and the big question about revolutionary thinking is, um, whoops. what is going on? That is what critical thinking is about. It's about trying to find out what is going on and why. Now, there are a lot of different aspects to critical thinking above and beyond uh, just being contrary, above and beyond just um, you know, uh, engaging in debate. Critical thinking also helps us, when we engage in it properly, to organize our thoughts. And when our thoughts are organized, they're easier to express. When our thoughts are organized, they're easier to communicate, both in uh, speaking and in writing. But also, when our thoughts are organized, we are able to better critically analyze our own thoughts and either build things from them or to critique them and change ideas that are not so hot. So, um, the basic method, um, again, there's no set method that is going to be appropriate all the time. There are going to be variations all the time. Uh, but the two main things I want to talk about to help people organize their thoughts are the method of argument um, and what counts as an argument strength. With these two things, to be able to understand both the form of arguments and then how to examine the content. So we've got form and content. We'll be able to better understand what constitutes a good argument, how to critique our own arguments to make them better and stronger, two, how to critique other people's arguments that we disagree with, and then three, to understand where our arguments are weak and, if necessary, to change them. There are certain positions that are just wrong. They don't have the strength, they don't follow, they don't have evidence, they don't have weight. Even right now, I engage in critical thinking. I'm sure, in some respects, I have positions that are just wrong. And if I critically thought about them, I would realize they don't follow well, right? They don't have the right form, or they don't have a good amount of strength. So it's not simply about critiquing other people's position or thinking about others' positions and showing why they're wrong. It's also important to think about our own positions and where they are weak. So um, let's get into the method of argument, and then I'll put the argument strength as we go. The method of argument has four main points. Oh, also as a side note, if you have any questions on any of the things, uh, feel free to interrupt. Um, just because I really want this to be widely spread, I want this to be like a foundation, a primer that I use and have been relatively successful in discussing revolutionary theory, thinking about revolutionary theory, talking about revolutionary theory, and then using that to help organize. Um, and so hopefully there will be other people around the country, around the world, watching this, and they can draw some conclusions. So if you have something that you think isn't correct, bring it up so they can analyze it, they can think about it. Um, or if you need a clarification, I'm sure there are a bunch of other people who would really enjoy that exact same clarification. So. With that said, this is the method of argument. And what you'll notice is there are four main parts. Question, answer, argument, criticism. Oh, I'm missing one. Let's throw this right in here. And the core of the method of argument is the third point, C, and that's the argument itself. And an argument is basically constituted by three things. Premises, conclusions, and links. And we'll get to that in a second. When you examine any argument, and what do we mean by an argument? 
What we mean is a position that is supported in some way. So it doesn't have to be supported well. Glenn Beck has plenty of arguments. Um, they mostly come in the form of assertions, right? Or single premises, Obama's a socialist, therefore he'll destroy America, right? The hidden premises that all socialists will destroy America, only if we're so lucky. Um, but the upshot of this is to really understand what an argument is getting at, you have to understand the question that's being asked. The question that's being asked is not always easily apparent. So let's go give a really good example of a difficult question. Pick up any newspaper and read any section on business. Pick up any economic, as long as it's not left-leaning, pick up any normal mainstream economic journal, economic magazine, and read it. And you'll get a lot of talk about the economy. The economy is doing poorly. The, uh, we need to kickstart the economy. We need to take X, Y, and Z actions to start the economy. But the question is never addressed. We need to get the economy back on shape. What's the question about any argument that talks about getting the economy back on shape? Oh, well, that seems clearly a very easy answer. It's about this is the argument of how to get the economy going. But if you'll notice, there's a lot more to this question, a lot of hidden presuppositions that are not so obvious. When they talk about getting the economy going, they rarely, except as an indicator, talk about unemployment. They rarely talk about real wages. What do they talk about? They talk about earnings. They talk about GDP, gross domestic product, right? Uh, how much America is making. Um, and then, you know, they talk about competitiveness. Right? or freeness of markets, or what have you. The question is not how to start the economy in most of these articles. The question is usually, how do we increase America's GDP? How do we increase America's trade? How do we increase America's exports? And more often than not, the question boils down to, how do we increase American corporations' profits? So answering the question is the very first step to understanding what the argument is really about. And so whenever you're confronted with an argument, ask yourself, not what the answer is, but what is the question that it is trying to answer. And if you can get this down, it's going to make it a lot easier to understand and analyze arguments. right? And this goes for everything. This goes for how should we hold immigration meetings? People are going to propose ideas. The question should be asked, uh, as we had Mindy asked earlier, the Rock for Rights, we were discussing, or uh, Rock for Revolution. Well, I don't think that's a good name. Why? The question being asked that was never explicit, or it was explicitly asked by Mindy, was who do we want to come here? It looked like a discussion about the name. It looked like a question of what should we name our event. But really, it was a question of what are the tactics best to draw people in. So again, I can't stress this enough. If you get the right question or questions down that the argument is trying to answer, it'll be much easier to analyze the argument. The second thing is the answer. The answer is usually pretty obvious and pretty broad, which is not to say there aren't nuances, which is not to say there aren't complexities. If you read Paul Krugman, for example, what does he advocate? Well, he advocates for stimulus. Uh, if you read um, Eschaton, Atrios, uh, uh, Duncan Black, he's an economist, right? He often writes about the economy. What does he talk about? Well, he talks about trains, he talks about uh, roads, he talks about building schools to get the economy going, to address unemployment. But the real answer is spending, right? Now, he can list all the different ways he wants spending and all the different projects and programs he would want spending, but the ultimate answer is spending. So once you get the general answer, and conversely, Milton Friedman, what is Milton Friedman's answer for everything? Deregulation. You got it. Deregulation. 
There may be all sorts of different ways things get deregulated. There may be all sorts of different schemes in which they deregulate it. Do we just sell the entire um, government agency? Do we just privatize all of Social Security and sell it to whatever people want to buy it? Do we make private accounts where everybody has their own, essentially, government-sponsored 401k and we just break it between all sorts of corporations? Right? What you'll notice is these are different ways, but the ultimate answer is going to be deregulation. Right? So again, the answer is going to be broad, but the details are going to be made in the argument. This is also where you need to be very careful about straw man arguments. And a straw man argument is where, rather than address the argument as it's being presented, you create a false argument, a weak argument, a straw argument, in order to make your position look good. So let's say Milton Friedman. One answer that you could give, and it would be a, a correct answer, is you could say, what, what does he want? Deregulation. Now that obviously has connotations and backgrounds, but also what I could say is he wants to rip away all of the institutions that working class people depend on for their survival. Now that may be true, it may be true, but you'll notice that's an answer, that answer requires support, right? What he's answering is deregulation. Now that may have implications, and I may build an argument that deregulation essentially strips working class people of all of their protections, but that's not his answer. That's my answer to the question, what does Milton Friedman really mean? And so it's very important to separate what we think the answer means, what we think the answer implies, and what their actual answer is. It's very easy to fall into an ideological position where you give their answer if you disagree with it, the worst possible light, and you give their answer, if you agree with it, the best possible light. A good example would be Democrats with Obama in Libya. What is Obama doing? He is engaging in a humanitarian mission. Obama said, he, the answer to the question is, what is he doing? He's engaged in a humanitarian mission. That's their answer, and they're just accepting Obama's answer of what is he doing. An equally truthful, perhaps even more truthful answer would be, he's bombing people. Now you can say he has every right to bomb people, you can say he has no right to bomb people, but the military intervention is his actual answer. The humanitarian aspect is just an implication of that answer of what to do in Libya. Now, if people agree with him, they'll say, no, they're stopping a dictator, you know, you have to do it because X, Y, and Z. If you don't agree, a lot of times you'll say, well, no, you don't have to do it because of X, Y, and Z. Again, then at that point you would present arguments. But just to repeat someone's answer as though it's the truth without giving support for it, right, shows a lack of concern about what the real answer is. And to make someone's position into something else is also to not really show any concern for what their real answer is. So, then we move on to the arguments. Arguments are the basic structure of conveying convincing information. Where you are trying persuasive to persuade someone that your position is correct. Or to demonstrate, either to them or to a crowd or to the internet, or to yourself, maybe, that one position is correct and the other is not. Well, what makes up an argument? First, you have premises. Premises are certain presuppositions or pieces of evidence that you take into consideration. So, for example, uh, I'll give the traditional uh, argument that has been passed on for Actually, probably only like a couple hundred years, but it's passed on like, like it was passed on forever. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Socrates is mortal. 
Now, what you'll notice is the premises here are usually definitional. Uh, this is known as a deductive argument, um, which is it's true by definition. Socrates is a man, um, the assumption being that all humanity is masculinity, and what it means to be a man is to have flesh and blood and live and die and blah, blah, blah. Men are mortal, or uh, to be a man, right, is to be a human being. Um, all men are mortal is to say, right, that human beings die, um, you know, and will eventually die for some reason. Ergo, and then this brings us to the conclusion, Socrates is mortal. The premises is that Socrates is a man, because he might be a demigod, right? I mean, Hercules was, or um, Jason was, or Zeus. But again, the premise is pretty strong, because we don't really have any reason to believe in that sort of mythology. The second is that most men are mortal, and again, barring like special exceptions, like some people believe in Christianity, or like um, the Upanishads, and Hinduism, and the Buddha, and whatever, but by and large, most people are considered to be mortal. So again, it's a fairly strong argument. That, yeah, we accept most people are mortal, that they're going to die someday, in some way. Ergo, if, he's, if Socrates is A, and A is B, then Socrates is B, right? So, you know, it seems to flow. The, uh, the conclusion is what you draw from the premises. Now, this may not be very descriptive, and it's not. And the reason why is because there are plenty of bad conclusions. Just because you have a conclusion doesn't mean that it's right or that it's well supported. Barack Obama is a socialist. Socialists destroy America. Ergo, Barack Obama is going to destroy America. Well, we don't really have, if you have a basic understanding of what socialism is, we don't really have any belief that Barack Obama is a socialist. Um, whether or not socialists will destroy America is up in the air, and as of right now, no socialist has ever destroyed America, so there's not really any reason to believe that. So there's no reason to believe Barack Obama will destroy America, right? The conclusion isn't necessarily well supported, but it's still the conclusion. You can see how it follows out of that. And it can be a completely absurd conclusion. That, that might even be true. Um, uh, Josh West is a... Uh, let's see. Let's, let's, let's try and come up with something good here. Josh West is a horse. Horses have long hair. Ergo, Josh West has long hair. Right? You'll notice the conclusion is true, and it's not really based on any of the premises. It's just what our argument, we say, bears out. Right? What is the consequence of our premises? Which brings us to the third thing, which is the link. This is where arguments usually, well, the links and the premises are where arguments are made or broken. Premises that are weak are not supported by evidence. If your premise, premise is weak, then it's, there's very little reason to believe the conclusion. We'll get more in this in the strength of the arguments. But like, for example, reptoids have replaced every major political figure in the, uh, in the world. Well, has anyone seen a reptoid? Well, not really. Not in any verifiable way. I mean, Photoshop notwithstanding. Uh, do we have any evidence of reptoids? Do we have reptoid eggs? Do we have anything that resembles reptoids? Well, no. And because the premise is weak, the conclusion is weak. Like, if we were tripping over giant eggs everywhere, and, you know, Barack Obama was shooting out his tongue to get flies out of the air, then, yeah, you know, that would be a pretty strong premise about the reptoids. But because we don't have that base of evidence, the premise is weak. The link is the connection between them. Josh West is a horse. For those of you who don't know, Josh West is not a horse, but is in fact a member of the Revolutionary Students Union, a human member, barring any reptoid-style secrets he may hold. We don't have any reason to believe Josh West is a horse, so the premise is false. Um, horses have long hair. Well, maybe, but you could also cut their hair. So that doesn't link well. Josh West has long hair. It doesn't really link. It's all a bunch of non sequiturs. Um, and sometimes the non sequiturs are a little more complex. Like, you don't care about the children, which is why you won't support charter schools. 
Well, what does caring about the children have to do with charter schools? The strength of charter schools for education are something completely unrelated to whether or not I do or don't care about the children. The question is, what is best for the children? And in that case, you would have to provide the link, oh, charter schools perform better because of A, B, and C, X, Y, and Z, which they don't, by the way. But that would be the sort of link you make. Or like, you don't support Barack Obama, so you're a racist. There are, all, there are plenty of people who don't support Barack Obama because they are racist. Um, but that doesn't mean everyone who supports him or doesn't support him is racist because they might have different reasons. Like, I don't agree with carpet bombing Libya. That's a reason, right? So it's the link. You've got to see the connections there. The connections have to be there. And we'll go over a little bit more of what those connections look like here in a second. And they might come with some criticism, but the idea here is that you never necessarily criticize a conclusion on its face itself, because the Josh West argument follows from the structure of the argument as such. All A or B, all B or C, therefore all A or C. Now, the A's, the B's, and the C's are all variables for things you can plug in, and you're going to get the same basic thing, whether it's Josh West or the horse, because Josh West has long hair, et cetera, et cetera. The structure is correct. What you plug into the argument may not be. Right, the premises. Yeah. So this brings us, and is there anything else on this little section here? So this brings us to criticism. What you want to do is you want to criticize either the premises or you want to criticize the link. Either You want to say, look, something you're saying here is not true. As a matter of fact, there are not reptoids controlling everything. Or as a matter of fact, we don't have strong evidence for reptoids. Or as a matter of fact, Josh West is not a horse. All of these would be the premises. Or you can criticize the link. No, I do care about the children, which is why I want them to have a good public education. I do care about the Libyan people, which is why I don't want them carpet bombed. I'm not a racist against Barack Obama because he's doing harmful things to racial minorities, uh, like continuing to criminalize the black population and engaging in more deportations than George W. Bush. Those don't criticize the premises necessarily. They criticize the link between them. The link between supporting, you know, being racist because you don't support him and, um, you know, the actual lack of support. Or I'm racist because I don't support him. So, again, these are the two areas you want to criticize. If you criticize the cr conclusion, and this is really important, ask yourself, am I criticizing a premise or a link? Because if you criticize a conclusion, all you're doing, no matter what you write, no matter how you write it, you are engaging in a very sophisticated, more or less, there are certainly less sophisticated ways, but there are also more sophisticated ways of saying, nah. -uh. We should not fight wars for profit. The Iraq war is a war for profit. We should not fight the Iraq war. No, but we, might, we have to fight the Iraq war. Because, because of Freedom. Well, should we fight wars for profits? Well, no, we shouldn't fight wars for profits. Well, is the Iraq war an Iraq war, uh, a war for profit? Well, yeah, it is. So we shouldn't fight the Iraq war. No, because we have to. Right? I'm sure you've run into this sort of logic or reasoning, to use the term loosely. If they agree that you shouldn't fight wars for profit, and they agree that the Iraq war is a war for profit, then it follows we shouldn't fight it. And if they just say, no, we should, then either they disagree with one of the premises, they disagree with the link, or they just don't like what you're saying. The fact that they don't like what you're saying doesn't make it false. Would a conclusion fall under an answer, though? Yeah. The conclusion and answer are linked, but sometimes there's more to the conclusion than just to the answer. So you're absolutely right. There's a very strong connection there. But like deregulation might be the answer. The conclusion from the premises might be cutting roads, cutting schools, cutting health care, cutting social security. Like usually the conclusions are more sophisticated. Or in addition, like if you're talking, you'll probably only have one conclusion. Right? And your conclusion will probably have an answer. It'll be the answer. Like if you're having a five minute conversation. If you're writing a 300 page book, you're going to have a main answer to the book, but you're going to have a lot of conclusions throughout, right? So 
For example, let's go back to the Iraq War example. Or let's go with Naomi Klein's shock doctrine. What is the answer to the book? Well, the question, or let's start with the question. What is the question to the book? Um, what is the way that capitalism functions today? The answer she gives is disaster capitalism, i.e. the shock doctrine by creating crises, it then profits. That's the answer. But what does she do? She goes through a bunch of arguments in the book. Well, what is a shock? A shock is where you disrupt the system. You disrupt the system because there's less resistance. If, you, if there's less resistance, then you are able to get what you want. They want to get what they want. Ergo, they want to get what they want. Ergo, they engage in shocks. Right? That's an, a, a conclusion. How do they engage in shocks? Well, Chile. They overthrow the government. They have the death squads. All of these, and then she makes an argument that those are shocks. And then she makes the argument that there were shock. There was the shock doctrine in Chile. And then she makes the argument that it was part of the free market capitalist ideology. And then she makes it about Iraq. And then she makes it about you know Asia or South Asia and in the tsunami. And so there's all of these arguments and all of these different building conclusions. But the ultimate answer of the book is all the pieces together. But you're right. You're right to point out that the answer and the conclusion are usually very linked. But that's why there's a little bit of difference between the conclusion and answer. Because you can have a lot of arguments within a body of work rather than just the conclusion itself. Does that? Yeah. Okay. So again, criticisms. You want to criticize on the links or you want to criticize the premises. Um, if you criticize the conclusion, you're just saying, nah. -uh. So, how should we look at the premises? How should we look at these links? Um, Chris, is this entire whiteboard on the, more or less? Because I'm going to start writing on that right side. Sure, I mean, next. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So, this is where we come to argument strength. And argument strength comes down to... Two big things. Weight of the evidence. Soundness of reasoning. Sorry, I'm just totally picking on the people who believe in reptoids today, because it's a good, that's a nice, easy one to go to. So, for example, the Federal Reserve. I have taken numerous economics classes. You can find it in numerous macro and micro economic textbooks, mostly macro. Uh, you can find it online, Wikipedia. You can find it in the federal government. They have entire websites devoted to the Federal Reserve. You can find articles about the Federal Reserve on everything from NPR, to Democracy Now!, to the Wall Street Journal, and whatever, all on how it operates. And so I have a lot of weight of evidence that, as a matter of fact, the Federal Reserve is a monetary institution, a macroeconomic monetary institution, which helps control the, sum, uh, the money supply in order to continue the economic policies of the United States. Right. There's another argument, which is the Federal Reserve is a secret alien plot to print too much money to destroy the economy so the reptoids can take over the earth. Okay, those are two claims, right? They both have weight, they both have evidence, but not the same amount. One. This is the most important part on the weight of evidence. And people rarely, rarely address this. Is the evidence verifiable? Now, okay, maybe, uh, like V, the TV show, we could capture the Federal Reserve guy and skin him. I like, I like the sound of that. Um, and underneath you'd be a reptile. Okay, all right, fair enough, that's verifiable. 
But often when it comes to the reptoid conspiracy, the claims in general are not verifiable. There is no amount of evidence that will ever verify the claim or, or not verify the claim that it's a reptoid conspiracy. I can literally show you how the monetary policy works, how it affects, how they make their decisions, how those decisions are based on keeping the capitalist economy of the United States running. I can make predictive claims about it. Those claims can be true. Any time I show that no, there is no basis for the red toy conspiracy of the Federal Reserve, that just shows the conspiracy is that good. Right? We've all heard this. It just shows how good they are to hide it. Well, that's the thing. If you're saying things like, well, that just shows how good they hit it, your claims aren't verifiable. A good example of this is history of communism. You look at the death rates, and there are periods where they spike. Good example. Great leap forward under China. The Chinese demographics show a spike in mortality rates. It's right there. The rates are not nearly as high as capitalists claim. And then those rates bottom out to some of the lowest in Asia. Well, I bet there were more people dying than they reported. Well, is that a verifiable claim? Because we have the statistics. And as a matter of fact, yes, more people died during the Great Leap Forward than immediately before it and immediately after it. That's a verifiable claim. You can make the claim more people died in the Great Leap Forward. And that's a strong claim to make because we can find out. We can look at the records. But no, people just weren't reporting it. Well, OK, people also weren't reporting that uh, hens were shitting gold. Why not? Why not? Oh, people weren't reporting that candy was growing from the ground. Yeah. Question. I mean, but how, uh, how much you can trust in the records and the reports that people give to you, for example? We're talking capitalism, right. communism, how, how reliable that was? Well, that's, that actually, that's a good question. And the very next thing is the credibility of the sources. Um, and again, no one of these is over, overwhelming, right? But they all work together. And so, but again, this is sort of the point, is if they're saying, well, you just don't know how bad it is. Good example is Cuba. I hear this all the time. You just don't know how bad it is in Cuba. You didn't go to Cuba. Well, you know who thinks it's not that bad in Cuba? The CIA. So why are we using your imaginary statistics that were never reported by anyone and have no basis in any facts when we have this is, should actually be credibility. Credibility of the sources. I got this from a GeoCities webpage is not credible. I got this from a guy on XM radio, is stronger, but not credible, necessarily, in and of itself. Unless it's a claim like, the guy on XM radio is a jerk. And you can say, well, what, what's the source for that? It's like, I listened to him, and he was a jerk. Okay, yeah, it's pretty credible. The guy on XM radio revealed the reptoid conspiracy. That's less credible. And the reason why is because there are levels of credibility. Now, again, this is critical thinking. It's about judgment. The very aspect of critical thinking is no one can tell you how to do it. It's on you to think critically. Is there only one source? Is there only one source, an obscure book written in some dead language from 200 years ago that proves your point? Well. If there's one book ever that was written, and it's not, well, here's a good example. I, I found a fake book in a Wyoming public library, because I was snowed in a Rollins. And it was this book by Nietzsche called My Sister and I. Now, I was a Nietzsche scholar at the time, and so I'm like, what the hell? I've never heard of this book before. And that's really weird that there's a Nietzsche book I've never heard. 
And so it basically goes and talks about this incestuous relationship he had with his sister. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for Nietzsche being a weirdo. But I'm like, this doesn't sit right, because he hated his sister. Weird. So here's the thing. This entire book is based off of English writings, a German manuscript that got burned down in a fire, of a merchant who was in the same Italian asylum, an English merchant who was in the same Italian asylum as Nietzsche, who smuggled out Nietzsche's manuscript to England, where this guy wrote and published this book, but there was a big fire, and the only existing manuscript was burned down. And, you know, that's why you can't verify it, and there's no translation, and it doesn't have any of his writing patterns. Well, that's not a credible source. If you look through the actual Nietzsche scholars, there's no less than five essays addressed to this specific thing. And what do they use? They use the entirety of his works. They show that it doesn't, this new work doesn't bear any similarities. They show that there are anachronisms. For example, uh, one that just sticks out in my head, the book claims, the Nietzsche, Nietzsche in the book claims that uh, he wants to visit all the great cities of America like New York and Los Angeles, or San Francisco and Detroit. But at the time, Detroit wasn't a big city. It didn't have the railway connections to be a big city. It was like a two-horse town. So why was he saying he needed to visit a great city when it wasn't even a big city? Again, the point is not necessarily that Nietzsche matters. The point is, suddenly, the credibility of this one source that says something against all the other sources becomes less and less and less and less and less. It may still be true, but critical thinking is, do we have any reason to believe it's true? Which is a different question, right? And a related question. Yeah. Um, so, using only one source can be known? Again, this depends on context. Yeah, I, I get that, but to like have credibility, it seems to be important to have more, more than one source, right? Yeah, well, and again, like for example, um, were you playing soccer today? No. Okay, because you kind of look like you're wearing the soccer uniform. Today. No, this is my children. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, I don't know. Again, let's 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 say this. Um, Chris Chris biked today to the meeting. I only need one source for that, really, to be credible. As Chris told me, he biked to the source or to the, you know, in, to the meeting today, right? Why? Because it's him. He knows what he does. He doesn't have any reason to lie to me about this. So one source is fine. The Soviet Union was state capitalism because I read an essay in the ISO, one essay in the ISO, and it said it was state capitalism. You'll notice then that is incredible, which is not to say you can't argue that the Soviet Union was state capitalist, but what would you have to do? You would have to look at all sorts of different sources. What is state capitalism? That is an answer. There, that's a question that needs an answer. What is state capitalism? Then you have to ask, does the Soviet Union fit that? Well, what would you have to do? You would have to look at all sorts of different documents on what state capitalism was. Then you would have to look at all sorts of documents, political documents, economic documents, sociological documents, historical documents, and not just one. You need a bunch, right, to show that, oh, this bad thing that happened you know, the state capitalist action wasn't a one-time deal, or just one person, or the bias of one particular person. You need a wide body of evidence. So for that, again, credibility requires a wide body of study and research. Whereas, Chris telling me he, he drove here, or Andrea telling me she got off work early. So basically, um, yeah. you can apply the scientific method to also to this, right? Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's really what's in question. What constitutes the scientific method? I mean, I would say use the method of argument. When you, if I give you a premise that the Soviet Union, let me give you an answer, a conclusion. The Soviet Union won World War II, nearly single-handedly. I say this all the time. Okay. Well, what would that, what would that require to be true? Now, Scientific method doesn't really tell us anything. What's the hypothesis? Well, I guess in a sense it's the hypothesis that 
the Soviet Union world, won World War II, and I guess I can test that hypothesis kind of through evidence, but it doesn't really fit the same sort of scientific model of, you know, very stellar parallax or gravity bends light. Right? There's different sort of experiments that function on that, which critical thinking can play a role. Like string theory, insofar as I understand it, isn't verifiable. That's one of the big criticisms of string theory, which is in science. It's a mathematical model. There are plenty of credible people who support it. But it's not getting traction because it doesn't verify that there are 12 dimensions. I think they're up to 12 dimensions now and the strings move across them. So even the scientific method can be subject to critical thinking, right? And even this particular method can be subject to critical thinking. I'm just trying to provide an introduction that people can, can use. I hope that, that doesn't sound like a cop-out or a... No. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't necessarily want to link it to the scientific method because I think scientists have their own ways of doing things depending on what kind of scientist they are. A geologist is not going to operate in the same way as a sociologist or an astronomer or what have you. But critical thinking, I think, can help with all of these. And then this brings us to this, uh, the third thing and final thing. spelling this wrong. It's okay. I've got bad enough handwriting. I can just pretend. It's, uh, countervailing evidence. This is critical to critical thinking and is often neglected. Let's say you want to make the argument that the Soviet Union is state capitalist. Okay. Fair enough. But in that case, you need to address all of the countervailing arguments. Or let's say Cuba. Cuba is an easier example and less controversial, at least for me. The Cuba state capitalist. Well, okay, let's say it's state capitalist. Well, then you need to define a state capitalism that increases life expectancy. You need to define a state capitalism that increases literacy from almost nothing to nearly 100%. You need to define a state capitalism that spends their own resources to send more doctors into the world than the World Health Organization. Every one of these arguments, which are in principle verifiable and credible, right? They can be verified um, through statistics, and they're credible. They come from places like the CIA, the World Health Organization, organizations that have no reason to lie in favor of Cuba. All of those are countervailing arguments to Cuba as a horrible, awful, repressive state. They don't have freedom in Cuba. Well, there's countervailing evidence in the entire neighborhood election system. So you need to explain how the entire political structure is somehow state capitalist or a dictatorship, even though people can participate and vote. It's different from ours, but you need to give an argument, a criticism, against that countervailing evidence. Otherwise, your weight of evidence is not very good. I have a friend who was in Cuba. Is that a verifiable claim? Are you going to bring your friend to me? No? Okay, so it's not verifiable. Is it a credible source? I don't know who your friend is. Is your friend a sociologist? Did, are, did they do sociological work? Did they do epidemiology? Did they do demographics of Cuba? Can they speak for all of the experiences of Cuba? Or just even general sociological trends? Uh, oh, they were a soccer player? Okay. Um, all right, well, does that address any of the countervailing is this the most qualified soccer player in the world who, who knows, again, for example, epidemiology and can explain why Cuba sucks so bad and yet has one of the highest standards of living in Latin America? Oh, he's not? He's just a, a football player? Oh, okay. Then in that case, the countervailing evidence is not very strong. Or in, for Cuba, the countervailing evidence is so strong, we have no reason to believe those claims. So in this case, it's up to us to weigh evidence. Everyone is going to weigh evidence different. Critical thinking does not mean independence of values. It does not mean whatever is supposed to be meant by objectivity. For me, certain values are going to be more important. How many dead kids? How many starving people? How many years can you expect to live? Um, these are important questions to me. How many people own mansions? How many people own Ferraris? How many people own their own businesses? 
These are questions that are important to other people. And of course, we can even have arguments about these values. Right? We can have arguments whether or not it's more important that children die, um, or whether or not it's more important that people own their own businesses. But even that would be subject to argument. We may not agree, but those values are going to determine how we weigh the evidence. So I want to be clear. Again, there's no shortcut, there's no easy answer. This is what it means to have human judgment, is you are responsible in the sense that no one can tell you how to do it perfectly or you know, completely. It's up to you to weigh evidence and judge things. So, yes? Um, you know, so I guess, so then, how, what's then the relationship of all this? We're talking about, you know, I guess you kind of touched on it, but like the, the verified claims, credible sources, counter evidence, and even like the example of a sociologist, if that isn't always necessarily a credible source because of then the relationship with power and the relationship of then knowledge and power and, you know, just the statement of human judgment is also always intersected by relationships and power and privilege and oppression and then what knowledge is available, what sources are available. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Sure. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, of course. All knowledge, all evidence we have are necessarily going to be conditioned by the society that we live in. They're going to be conditioned by the background that we have. They're going to be conditioned um, by who has the power, and, and at least in our society, who has the money to fund certain studies. Um, so the very fact that there is a vagueness to the accuracy does not mean that there is no direction in which we can move. Now, <coughs> there's going to be power. There's going to be um, money. There's going to be all sorts of intersecting relationships. But nevertheless, that's going to be true regardless. So what we should do is we should do the best with what we've got. Now, if the Rand Corporation, um, or let's say the Cato Institute, funds a sociologist, uh, which just so happens to discover, or uh, here's a good example, um, there's the Freedom Index. And the Freedom Index has Cuba and North Korea and China as the most unfree places in the world. And they have places like the United States and Australia and Israel as the most free places in the world. Now this is a piece of evidence. And of course, the reason they can put this out is because they have a shit ton of money and they have an entire ideological education system that teaches people to show for them. Of course. But the question is, as thinking people, assuming that we are or want to be thinking people, how should we interpret this data? How should we give it credibility? That doesn't mean we, we should ignore it, right? Like, if you'll notice, the Rand Corporation does a really good job of saying things and what it means. Like, for example, one of the key components, or two key components for freedom, is ability to get credit and ability to start your own business. And it really measures that stuff. Right? I mean, this comes back to value. That's the evidence it's weighing. And of course, there's all sorts of ideological power tied up with that. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean we have to accept it. But also, it doesn't mean that there's a God or there's a secret hidden truth that we then are privileged to because we don't accept it. It's a matter of power and ideology warring with each other. Now, we also shouldn't necessarily accept everything the Party for Socialism and Liberation puts out. Um, but also, we are, the other danger is to engage in empty skepticism. We have to accept some sort of evidence, or if we don't have to accept any sort of evidence, then anything goes, and then it doesn't matter. In which case, then fascism is the same as liberalism is, well, that, one's, that one is true. But um, fascism is the same as communism, and liberalism is the same as indigenism, and imperialism is the same as resistance and all violence is the same, and all pacifism is the same as violence, because if we don't accept evidence or arguments, 
then anything goes. And in addition, it becomes self-refuting, because then, in that case, if anything goes, then the position that arguments are what we should also would go. So, yes, we should always be conscious of this. That's why we need the, the credible sources is really essential. Where are these coming from? Do they have a vested interest? We should weigh those things, but not ignore them. Um, and then the next one we'll get into some ways in which that evidence is weighed relative to the conclusion. Sorry, go ahead. Um, but, you know, so I understand all you're saying. So then what about when your credibility, when you're on the downside of the power imbalance, or when your credibility is, so then how does that factor into this? Credibility to whom for what? Again, this goes back to values. Look at anywhere in the United States. Communism is pretty much a dirty word, right? You can see all of the terrible things that communism has done and how awful it is and whatnot. And I think communists in the United States are certainly in the power imbalance. I think communists in the world are certainly in the power imbalance. Which is why, just as myself, as a communist, that's why I read the Black Book of Communism. That's why I go to the CIA. Um, because even because power is not monolithic. No, of course not. And so what you'll find is you'll find even within power itself, to whatever extent, power isn't, ba it isn't simply insanity, in which power generates knowledge rather than, you know, nothing. Um, it has to use some rubric, some sort of criterion. So the CIA can and does in the State Department spend reams and reams of paper printing propaganda about Cuba, but when it comes to making geopolitical decisions, when it comes to analyzing them concretely through demographics, which are useful to them, then, then they do a good job because the truth, or the knowledge more accurately, is important for them to make pragmatic decisions, ultimately for them to undermine the Cuban revolution. If I had different values, I would look at the CIA. If I, was, if I had capitalist values, I'd look at the CIA fact book, and I'd point out their purchase power and parity, I'd point out their GDP, and how low they are. Because, again, that's the dominant discourse, is money and power and purchase. But if we have values, even the dominant power itself opens itself to critique, insofar as it has to present facts. So if you value less dead kids, you have a strong argument to be made. And it's an imperative on people who are offering that to bring to light those evidence, that evidence as an argument, as a body of evidence against capitalism, rather than, which is often the case, especially in academia, especially in philosophy and English departments, um, to simply engage in a global skepticism against all evidence. All that evidence comes from capitalism. All that evidence comes from power. All that evidence comes from, you know, discursive structures. Yeah, I'm not saying you are, but also that's a very common response. So for me, it's about building a body of evidence against power. Um, one might even go back to the biblical dynamic of truth to power as the mechanism of which you undercut the positions. Now again, if we're being honest, there's always the chance that the evidence for communism is not good. There's always the chance that the evidence for revolution is flawed and false, and there's no reason to believe in it. It's up to us to weigh that evidence. So we should always be open to a change in possibility. But nevertheless, that also means weighing the evidence, and just for me personally, and I'm guessing for everyone in this room, that means when you weigh the evidence, the evidence of the monstrous nature of capitalism is um, overwhelming to the demand of any thinking moral person, which again would be an argument. What is a thinking person? What is a moral person? But I, th I think it can be made. But the overwhelmingly monstrous nature of capitalism provides an argument of revolution of which there is very little countervailing evidence. And if it is, it's weak and usually not credible. Sorry. I mean, something that maybe sum this up is the point, slaveholders never had to make arguments for slavery. They just take a gun in your face and say you're a slave now. Same thing, the capitalists don't have to make arguments for capitalism. They can engage in rhetoric, they can engage in all sorts of sophistry, where they manipulate people and thinking that capitalism is a good thing, and again, this manifests itself 
very reason why we're having this discussion is how do we break through these sort of circular logic reasonings? Well, capitalism is good because it gives us freedom, and but where did the freedom actually come from? It choose market systems, et cetera, et cetera. So the point being is that, yeah, in a certain sense, power never has to make arguments for itself. And yeah, we can mount all the evidence against it that we need to to show why it's the case, to give it to other people that, yes, capitalism is a monstrous system. But to try to reason with capitalism, the actual people who are capitalists who are benefiting. Um, you know, you can take Barack Obama and say, you're, you're doing a humanitarian mission, but what does that actually entail, et cetera, et cetera. There's no subject of uh, interrogation with Barack Obama. You don't sit down and talk to him. He gives you reasons, but they're just a bunch of bullshit. Not that. So, um, with, with uh, all the evidence, like, uh, you know, of communism being good, how come it's not popular in, like, all over the world? Well, and so that's, that is good countervailing evidence, right? If there is a truth to communism, why isn't it popular? That's a good question. Why is communism not popular? And so, well, actually, it's communism is good. That's my answer. The countervailing argument is, well, why isn't it popular? Right? And that's a good countervailing question. And that's something that needs to be addressed. And how would you address that? You would address that through evidence. Well, plenty of things are popular but are suppressed. Like, for example, the trillions of dollars spent to destroy communism by the United States and France and England and Japan. Well, that's one reason it's not popular. They have most of the money and they can compare most of the propaganda. So it doesn't matter the, the weight of the evidence? Well, no, that's the thing is, to your countervailing evidence, I'm offering concrete things. Not just, because it's verifiable. We can find out during the Cold War how much money the West spent to destroy communism. And we can look at the demographics of the rise of the Communist Party USA, and we can also see its decline. And we can see all sorts of reasons for its decline. So we would build an argument for its decline. People became comfortable. There was imperialism in the third world, and Americans stopped caring about it, right? And so to address that, what I would need to do is I would need to construct several arguments on why it's not popular. And just off the top of my head is one, the capitalists spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of dead bodies to make sure it's not. The second thing is that it's a relatively new movement. Historically speaking, it's only 200 years old, whereas capitalism and republicanism and we're fighting for like 500 years. And then the third thing is, well, I mean, China has its problems, but if we're looking at it, at least a sixth of the globe is communist, at least in name. And there are red struggles all over Latin America, all over India, more so now in Eastern Europe. We're looking at uh, you know, a, a Europe tottering, about to fall, possibly to revolution. So my countervailing argument is, well, actually, it is pretty popular. Like, again, a billion plus people you know, out of six billion population is not too bad a number. And when I say that, right, when you think about it, a billion people who are communists, that actually is a pretty strong argument that it is really popular. And so the point is not to dismiss it, right? Because it's making a variable claim that it's not popular. But an, another person can came with the idea when it's not popular, that it's getting forth. Oh, you can say it's popular. Well, then, then it becomes a question of what do you mean by popular? Yeah. And then that's another discussion, right? And so you can move on to that. And the method of argument can apply to that, and they say, well, what do you mean by popular? Or, well, that's not really that popular. Then you can use the method of argument. Question, what does it mean to be popular? They'll give you an answer. Well, people in the U.S. don't like it, and then they have to give an argument for that. Or you can just say, well, there's a good reason. It's because the U.S. gets most of the... You could say this. You would have to give an argument. Well, the U.S. gets most of the benefits of all the bombings and all the oil, and... So of course they like it, you know? They get to criminalize immigrants and use their labor at Wendy's and McDonald's and in the fields. Of course they're gonna support that, it benefits them. Or, you know, a million other different arguments, right? But that's the thing, is the method of argument can always be applied. It can always go deeper, or it can always go back. If the premise is a problem, if you think there's a false premise, make an argument for the premise. Right? And then you can examine that premise. 
If you think that argument is good, when you're thinking about it, okay, well, this is the argument. You can add another argument to it. Okay, capitalism is flawed. Well, then you make an argument. What kind of system would I like to see? And maybe it leads you to communism. Maybe it leads you to anarchism. Maybe it leads you to some other sort of socialism. But by breaking down what you're thinking about, it becomes easier to analyze it, to build off of it, to change it, and to make it stronger. I mean, I would just add that there's this notion of like people have an opinion about something, and again, it's mostly the case is can we ask, do they have an examined opinion of it, or is it just a sort of uncritical hearsay which they just adopt? A lot of people in the United States don't like immigrants. Well, that's an opinion, usually substantiated on bad evidence, such as they take our jobs, et cetera, et cetera, they bring crime, which are not verifiable but true. So when we make, it's actually a fallacy to say, well, I'm popular. It's not popular, or it is popular, that doesn't make it right or true. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing, right? At one point, slavery was popular. At one point, human sacrifice was popular. But, I, but the thing is, that's a weak, you'll notice that's a weaker argument, right? Because it doesn't really, it's not really verifiable in any substantial way. Um, it's not really a credible source. It's just like, oh, you're engaged in a fallacy. It doesn't really address the evidence, the concrete reality. And then it doesn't really address the countervailing evidence. It, it, it essentially says, no, your evidence is wrong. It doesn't matter. Now, don't get me wrong, logical fallacy should be addressed. But, and maybe I haven't made this clear, I want this as an activist understanding of thinking. I don't need you doing formal deductive proofs. I don't need or want you necessarily, and you can do it on your own free time, to engage in deep philosophical questions of why. Why? Yes, okay, that's fine on your free time. But the series that I want to create is revolutionary thinking. It's going to help you with revolutionary speaking. It's going to help you with revolutionary writing. I want this as an activist tool. This should be understood not as truth, as a tool. Just like a hammer, just like a rifle, just like a printing press. This is a way for people to think about problems in their community, with their friends, with their family, when they're discussing, when they're debating, not just discussing, when they're debating, this sort of tool will help you understand and deal with the arguments in a, in a better fashion. And will help you if you critically analyze, generally, win people to communism or anarchism or socialism. Because there's a fundamental thesis that I hold, and this is my position, and it's a communist position, or at least the majority of communism, the orthodox communist position, and it's an enlightenment position. And the position is that every single human being, with only maybe a few exceptions of people who, I don't know, are mentally retarded, perhaps, um, every person has access to rationality. Every person can think. Every person can cr think critically. Um, every person can analyze data. Now, they don't necessarily have to do it right. They may not do so in an honest fashion because they might have their own interests at stake. It's not in Bill Gates' in interest to get socialism going, even if he could think about it and want it to be true. But this principle that everyone can have a rational discussion and be swayed by evidence and strength of evidence is, I think, a fundamental thesis. And if you don't believe that, then it doesn't really make a lot of sense to go to the working class and try and get them to do anything. Because if they can't think, then why the hell should they care? Why, why not just play their Xbox? Happy as they are. Yeah, happy as they are. I, but they're not. That's the thing. Is I think most people are not happy as they are. Because they think, but the problem is they don't necessarily think clearly. Their thoughts are confused and jumbled. Which is fine, we can have a lot of different thoughts on a lot of different things and they can interact in different ways. And there's all sorts of layers to things, like you may value human life. Now that may lead you in some way to be against violence. But in another way, it may lead you to violence, right? Che was a doctor. Plenty of revolutionaries, right? Plenty of the Maoists are doctors in India. Why? Because they're sick of seeing poor people starve to death. They're sick of seeing people die, literally die of diarrhea. And so they take up violence to stop the systemic violence of capitalism. So you'll notice 
the respect for human life can simultaneously push us in the direction towards nonviolence, but also push us into the direction of violence. But if we clarify why, why it pushes us in one direction and why it pushes us in the other, we'll have a better ability to understand our position and change it. Change it either to nonviolence or violence, depending on our values. So does that? Soundness of reasoning is the final aspect. So weight of evidence and soundness of reasoning. Do they connect and support the conclusion? You only want immigrant here because you want to destroy America. <coughs> what does that have to do with the conclusion? We shouldn't have immigrants. There are plenty of reasons to think that we should have immigrants that have nothing to do with destroying America or my intentions. It doesn't connect. It's a red herring. It's a non sequitur. It doesn't follow. I have to believe in I have to believe in America because if I didn't, I couldn't live with myself. Okay, well what does you living with yourself have to do with America bombing other people? It doesn't. You've got to make sure that the, there's a connection and support of the conclusion. Now, there are gray areas. Anarchists pulled priests out into the street and, and shot them in Spain. The Soviet Union executed plenty of people. Now, you can use that as evidence to support something like communism and anarchism is violent and oppressive. Okay. That is connected in a way to the conclusion, but not necessarily. Right? The Soviet Union was fighting a civil war, they were invaded. The Spanish anarchists, for example, were being oppressed by priests. Like priests could literally take land and force people to fight or to work for them and fight in the army and do all sorts of awful things. So are we going to blame the Spanish anarchists or are we going to blame the priests that oppress them? It's connected, but it's not as directly connected, right? And so you've always got to be careful on this connection. You have to weigh how closely things are connected to the evidence. The next thing is the cohesiveness to other evidence. This kind of goes back to credible source. If you have one piece of evidence that says, I don't know, Barack Obama's a rat boy, but then you have a whole history of birth records, you have all of his friends, all of his family, all, all of his history, you have photographs of him from a baby on, it doesn't really fit with the evidence. If you have anarchists executing priests, you also have them running cooperatives. You also have them feeding hungry people. You also have them running health clinics. Did they execute people? Yeah, you better believe they did. But as a positive movement in Spain, there was a cohesiveness of the evidence that they helped more people. You can say, oh, the Soviet Union was brutal and violent, but the cohesiveness of the evidence of increased literacy rate, of increased schools, of increased rights for women, of increased rights for children, of increased workers' rights, of um, you know, longer life expectancy, the defensive actions taken, that they didn't you know, attack other people. Suddenly, that evidence isn't as cohesive as people would want you to think. Now, this is a somewhat abstract concept, and so again, it comes down to judgment and values, right? We need to be aware of what it is we're trying to do. So this is my basic introduction to reasoning. Um, I talked about it a little before, but I want to be really clear. Is this still running? I want to be very clear on what I'm providing here, or trying to provide here. This is not for philosophy. This is not for academia. This is for the people that I know in Texas, in St. Louis, in Florida, who have difficulty putting their ideas in order. And it doesn't just hurt them and their thinking about ideas. And they know that it hurts them. They're always asking me, not that I mind, but they're always asking me to read. Read what they've written. Read a response they're giving to someone. Well, I'm not particularly special. It's just a matter of training. It's a matter of learning how to think in this fashion, and then anyone can do it. They may not want to think in this fashion, and there are other fashions in which to think, and that's fine. 
but this is a tool for them to organize their thoughts so that they can think about it more closely. And more important to me, when you organize your thoughts, it's much easier to present those thoughts to other people. And that's what I'm in the business of. It is vitally important that we think clearly so we can present our thoughts clearly, powerfully, and succinctly to working class people. So that's what I got. Um, any additional questions? You want to break into groups? Four questions? It's just burned out with me talking. All of the above. Which one after? Okay. Do we want to call this close? Do we want groups? We did start half hour late, so. I'm making a chop pepper the next groups. Okay. Straw poll. All in favor of groups, raise your hand. All against groups. All in favor of question and answer, raise your hand. All against. <laughs> if people have questions, answer. Do you have any other questions or comments? Anything, but if anyone else has questions, I'd be like, I'd like to them. All right, well, uh, again, thank you. The next, hopefully the next one in the series will be uh, Speaking Revolution, where we'll take, again, if it's approved, we'll take everything we've learned here and we'll apply it to actually talking to concrete people in different situations. So hopefully that will be coming up soon. Again, it's democratically approved. And I hope ultimately all of you enjoyed this lecture and all of you watching at home enjoyed this discussion.